so does this, is this working? Okay. Great. Uh, yes, thank you all. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak, and I'm very happy to be speaking with you all today. And yes, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, I aimed for a bit of a shorter talk to have time for interruptions and discussion afterwards, so, so please do. Um, okay, so I'm just going to jump right in it. I think there are a lot of people that are familiar with the themes that I'll be talking about today, but just to make sure that we're on the same page with uh, the words that I'm using. Um, First, the first kind of set of results I'll talk about are uh, in this, what we call implicit regularization or implicit bias or algorithmic regularization or inductive bias of optimization. Uh, and the kind of high level idea is that the usage of optimization algorithms themselves, uh, even when you don't Im uh, you know, impose explicit forms of regularization, can be a form of regularization. And so the kind of classical examples of this are uh, if you think about gradient flow in least squares, where you have more parameters than, than examples, uh, and you start from, you initialize from the origin, then gradient flow converges to the minimum L2 norm solution that interpolates the data. Right? Even though there's no L2 regularization in, in this problem uh, explicitly, just the usage of gradient flow itself is something that minimizes the L2 norm uh, of the solution that's found. Right? And something that's gotten some more attention over the past few years has been looking at gradient descent or gradient flow or other optimization algorithms over uh, in classification problems that, uh, you know, where you're minimizing, say, the exponential loss or the logistic loss, uh, some type of convex surrogate for the zero one loss. Uh, and in these settings, when there are many possible ways to fit the data, gradient flow and gradient descent converge in direction to things that satisfy uh, the KKT condition, or th that satisfy uh, margin maximization, right? So, this minimum L2 norm solution subject to these margin constraints. Right? Even though there's nothing in this problem that explicitly says something about minimizing L2 norms or anything about this constrained optimization problem, uh, this is what the optimization algorithm itself favors, are solutions that uh, satisfy these constraints and that minimize the L2 norm subject to these constraints. Um, and so something that we'll talk about later is, is kind of analog to this story in, in gradient flow and descent on neural networks, where the, the story is necessarily more complicated because the optimization is non-convex, um, but uh, really seems to be key to the story of the success of deep learning, or at least that's, that's what I think and that's what some people think. <laughs> um, okay, so that's going to be the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk is going to be on uh, benign overfitting. So the, by, by, by benign overfitting, I, I'm talking about settings where you have some type of estimation problem or learning problem where there's noise, right? So there's noise, uh, and you're looking at the generalization performance of uh, classifiers or, or models that perfectly fit the training data, right? So things that achieve 100% training accuracy under some uh, loss, so say like the risk squared loss or the zero one loss. Uh, and so, since there's noise in the problem and you're achieving a perfect fit to the data, you know that you're overfitting in the kind of standard statistical sense of, you know, having a better fit to your data than what you uh, can expect from the noise level in your problem. Uh, but what's been observed, you know, in neural networks and, uh, and in many, and now in, in a variety of settings is that these models can, even though they're overfitting to noise, can still generalize well, right, even optimally. And so that's kind of the kind of benign aspect is that you're overfitting, but it doesn't really seem to hurt your uh, prediction performance so much. Um, and a reason this has been, you know, uh, attracting a lot of interest from statisticians and, and, and learning theorists is that it seems very hard to rec uh, reconcile this type of behavior with uh, classical ways of understanding generalization from uh, uniform convergence. All right, so if it's a noisy problem, that means that uh, the best possible risk that you could achieve, right, uh, is going to be at least some constant. And when you're looking at interpolators, right, things that achieve perfect fit to the training data, that means that your empirical risk is going to be zero. Right, so that means that the gap between your population risk and your empirical risk is going to be exactly equal to your population risk, right, because the empirical risk is zero. Right, and, that, and that's the kind of striking thing is that the, the standard approach for trying to understand generalization performance is to look at what's happening in your training data, and maybe have some type of complexity measure of your function class and say that as long as the number of samples is much larger than that complexity, then the gap between what you're seeing on your training data and your test data will vanish. Right? But this is uh, an impossibility in, in, in the setting where there's noise and you're overfitting. 
Right? So trying to kind of reconcile how you can have generalization even when you're interpolating and it is a kind of main question uh, of this new sub area of theoretical machine learning and statistics. Um, and just to say, you know, just like in the implicit regularization story, we have a pretty good understanding of how this happens in, in some restricted classes of linear models, but, but beyond that, uh, the story is more complicated and, and much harder to understand. Um, and so that's what I'll be talking about is uh, a kind of some vignettes about uh, implicit regularization and benign overfitting in neural networks in a particular regime. Uh, and the regime uh, which we'll look at is what happens when you train on what we call high dimensional data. So uh, it's not exactly just that D is much, the dimension is much larger than the number of samples, but it's something of the similar flavor uh, that, that we'll talk about in, in just a second. Um, and we'll show that, base, that gradient flow can have an implicit bias or have an implicit regularization effect towards low rank uh, neural networks. And that's gonna be kind of first part of the talk. Uh, and then the second part of the talk, we'll talk about how to use this characterization of the implicit bias of gradient flow to say something about benign overfitting in neural networks. Okay. Okay, so just wanna quickly review some uh, recent work on implicit bias in, in uh, neural network classification problems. Right, so what we have here, what we'll be looking at is uh, classification problems where you have some type of uh, you know, convex surrogate for the zero one loss that you're doing optimization over. So either you can think of the logistic loss, which is this L that we have here, or, or the exponential loss, uh, the same results apply. Um, and we'll look at gradient flow, which is this equation in, in red, which just says that it's a dynamical system where the change in the parameters is governed by the negative gradient of the loss at, at, at that time. Okay, and so associated to this uh, class of functions of these neural networks is a margin maximization problem, which is in that kind of pink equation one. Right, so this is uh, trying to minimize the L2 norm constraints. So if you imagine all the parameters in your neural network, you concatenate them into one vector. And if you minimize the L2, the problem is to minimize the L2 norm of that concatenation subject to this margin constraint. Right, so the yi's are gonna be plus minus one, N of xi theta is gonna be the neural network output on an example xi with parameters theta. And we want all of the examples to lie at least distance one from, uh, you know, from, from away from, uh, at a margin of at least one. Uh, and this, these very wonderful results by uh, Liu Li and, and G. Telgarski from a few years ago show that for a very large class of neural networks, um, which we, uh, are called homogeneous neural networks, um, so if you haven't seen this before, homogeneous neural networks just means that if you scale the parameters uh, by some multiple alpha, then the neural network output is also scaled by alpha to the L for some L. Right, so basically if you have a deep ReLU fully connected ReLU network or you have max pooling layers, all of these satisfy this homogeneity uh, condition. Uh, so it's, it's a really large class of neural networks that is captured by this. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, positively homogeneous, yeah. Um, and so if you, have, if you haven't seen that before, it doesn't really matter. Just the idea is that this captures a lot of neural networks in practice and it'll capture these two layer neural networks that we'll be talking about shortly. Um, so so what, they, what they showed is that if you consider gradient flow uh, over homo a homogeneous neural network and there's some time where the empirical risk is small, right? So if it's, as long as it's smaller than one over n where n is the number of examples, uh, then gradient flow converges in direction to a first order stationary point or a KKT point, KKT standing for Karush Kuhn Tucker conditions, uh, of this margin maximization problem. Right? And, and that the logistic law and, and that the empirical risk, logistic loss or the exponential loss, whatever loss you're using, goes to zero. Right? And so this is a quite striking result because, of course, there's nothing. Uh, a priori about looking at this optimization problem that suggests that you know, doing gradient flow over the logistic loss should have anything to do with uh, the KKT, uh, this margin maximization problem. Uh, and moreover, when this neural network can have arbitrary structure, right, other than just homogeneity. Right? So it can in particular have as many parameters as, as you'd like. 
it can have all kinds of weird architectures, but the same thing is going to happen as long as the, the loss reaches a small enough point, it will converge in, direct, in direction to something that satisfies the, the KKT conditions for this margin maximization problem. Uh, and so something that's nice here is that, again, there's no assumption about the number of parameters, there's no assumption about initialization. Right? So it really allows you to abstract away from some of the details that make it difficult to understand uh, neural network training. And, and by understanding just the uh, structure, the geometry of this margin maximization problem, it elucidates a lot of, uh, you know, it elucidates something about the limiting behavior of, of neural network training. Um, okay, so I just want to make sure that we're clear on this point because the rest of the talk is going to be talking about what are the consequences of, uh, you know, what are the structure of neural networks that satisfy KKT conditions for margin maximization for this problem? And if we can say anything about that, then we're really kind of illuminating the role of optimization in, in either whatever, whatever thing that we're able to deduce from these KKT conditions, whether that's you know, generalization or adversarial robustness. If we can show that just the KKT conditions for margin maximization imply something, then it really shows that optimization, the implicit bias of optimization is playing a key role in, in that phenomenon that we're looking at. Um, so, the, it's, it's, a quite, it's a little complicated, but the easiest way to think of it is uh, if you think about what's happening in the linear setting, right? So, so in the linear setting, you have, like, uh, that was this result that I uh, talked about a little earlier, right? So, so basically the proof is somewhat of a, is like a generalization of what's happening when you do gradient descent on the exponential loss. Uh, I mean, intuitively, you are, min you are like kind of trying to maximize the margin with this, right? Because you have uh, the, you, in order to minimize the exponential loss, you want to uh, maximize the margin on all the examples. Um, and when you have exponentially tailed losses, uh, essentially only the, the smallest margin example ends up dominating everything because you have exponential minus something. And, you know, basically when you have things inside exponentials, the smallest thing dominates. And so that's the kind of, minute-long uh, idea, but otherwise you can just kind of trust that this is true and, and, and then maybe you want to investigate why it's true after. Um, okay, okay, so this is just saying what, what I just mentioned. Uh, and just, just as a note, any other, al you know, I'm going to be saying gradient flow does X, Y, or Z here, but actually any other algorithm that produces max margin neural, net, neural nets would have the same properties that I'm talking about. Right, but what we know is that gradient flow is the, thing, is the thing that satisfies that, and that's what's of interest for trying to understand deep learning, but just a kind of little caveat. Okay, so what are the actual um, networks that we'll be talking about are these two-layer leaky ReLU networks. Um, so leaky ReLU is just a kind of uh, version of the ReLU activation where uh, instead of the, the derivative being zero on one part of the plane, it's, uh, it's equal to gamma. Right? So the derivative is always at least some constant gamma. Um, and we'll look at training two layer nets where we're just training the first layer and not the second. Right? So we have upcoming work that shows what happens with this training the second, but all the kind of key difficulties and ideas come from training the first. Because right? training the first layer allows for you to have feature learning, it allows, it's, it's a non-convex optimization problem, so most of the difficulty comes with training uh, the first layer. Uh, and we'll look at what happens with the logistic loss. Our results also hold for exponential loss. And again, we aren't going to be assuming anything about the initialization. Right? And we also not be assuming anything about the number of neurons in the network. So M is the number of neurons in the network. We're not assuming that you know, anything like an NTK type analysis or, or mean field. It's an arbitrary number of neurons in the network. Um, and just a quick note, this phi is, is one homogeneous, and so the neural network output is also uh, one homogeneous. Right? In particular, all the, all the results that hold for the implicit bias of homogeneous neural networks hold, hold here. Okay, so here's the, the when I say high dimensional, what I mean is, uh, is this two, these two sets of properties here. Right, so the main one is the one in blue, uh, and then the one next to it is also uh, needed. Um, but this, this definition, the idea is that we want the training data to be nearly orthogonal. 
Right? So there's this kind of, I guess, aphorism that people say that in high dimensions, things are nearly orthogonal. Um, and that's like mostly true. Um, and that's what this definition in blue is trying to formalize. Right? If, you have, if you have data that's literally orthogonal, then this is trivially satisfied. Right? But uh, if you have data that's not exactly orthogonal, then this is like a way of, of, of formalizing that. Um, and it, I think the thing that's really nice about this definition is that it doesn't depend at all on a distribution. It doesn't depend at all on the labels of the data, training data. All it depends upon is a geometric uh, property of the features x. Right? And so you might ask, like, when does this hold? When does this not hold? Okay, so the kind of running example to have in your mind is if you have isotropic Gaussian, then when d is at least n squared up to log factors, then this condition holds. Uh, you can think about generalizing this to uh, sub-Gaussian distribution with independent components. Uh, then as long as the kind of version of the rank of the covariance matrix is large enough, then this is satisfied. Um, but there is one setting where this is not satisfied even when d is really, really large. Uh, relative to n, and that you can think of this as if you have a, a, a Gaussian de, a design, but where there's one component that has very high variance and the rest of the components have uh, identity variance. Right? So this is not going to satisfy near orthogonality because whenever you take two examples, the dot product in that high variance direction is going to be very large. Right? And that's going to dominate on the right-hand side relative to the norm of the examples, right? Because we need the, the squared norm to be at least n times the maximum pairwise correlation. Right? So that's just a little caveat that we can't actually capture. This is not hold in all high-dimensional settings, but it is at least a regime of, of high-dimensional uh, data. Okay. All right, so here's our first uh, result. Um, so if we let f be this uh, two-layer leaky value network, and we consider this margin maximization problem. Right, so if you concatenate the weights of a two-layer leaky or two-layer neural network where you're just training the first layer weights, uh, the L2 norm of all the weights is just the Frobenius norm of, of the first layer weights. Um, and you know, so that's the associated margin maximization problem for the for this uh, problem. And so if we have this uh, high dimensional data assumption and we let V be the weights, you know, this matrix corresponding to weights uh, for the first layer. And we assume that this V satisfies the KKT conditions for problem one. Then the following holds. Uh, so the first thing is that the rank of this matrix is at most two. Right, so uh, this is a matrix that's m by d, so m the number of neurons, and d is the input dimension. So in principle, it could be at least m or d. Um, but if you're going to satisfy the KKT conditions, it has to be rank at most 2. The second is that the decision boundary is linear. Right, so this two-layer leaky value network has the possibility of being nonlinear, right? I mean, it has the capacity to approximate any continuous function. But if you want to satisfy the KKT conditions for margin maximization, you have to have a linear decision boundary. And so there's some vector z such that the sine of z dot x is the same as the sine of the neural network output. Uh, and then the last thing is that uh, this z has a very simple form. It's a z. Uh, you know, so when you're doing classification problems, the scale doesn't matter, just the direction. Uh, so what, what we can say is that the, the direction of z is the same as the direction of a nearly uniform average of the training data. Right, so z is given by sum of si, yi, xi, where the si's are strictly positive, and the, the maximum ratio of those si's is, is at most a constant. Okay, and, and then, of course, for any initialization, uh, gradient flow converges in direction to a network satisfying above. Right, so so, so there's, there is something there. It's not immediate that this holds from the previous theorem I stated. You need to be able to say that the loss gets small enough at some point in order for these implicit bias results to kick in. And, and we show that in this non-convex problem, the loss does get small enough in order for, for that to happen. Yeah? Can, can you say this again? For all labels. 
correct. Right, so if you even have completely random labels, this is something that will hold. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so this result holds for any labeling. There's nothing about, there's no sample complexity in anything right now because there's no generalization. This is, just, this is just properties of optimization from this geometric characterization of the training data. Later in the talk, we'll talk about how to say something about generalization. So if we assume that the x i's, if the x y pairs are i i d from a distribution, we can say something about generalization. But right now, all this is saying is what are the properties of optimization from the fact that the norm squared are much bigger than the pairwise correlations, and that the maximum ratio of the norms is at most a constant. Yeah, well, there's implicitly not every n and d can satisfy these conditions. Right? Um, so basically, you need D to, like, if you think about isotropic Gaussian, D needs to be at least n squared. Um, but really, all, so the question is, like, when are these assumptions satisfied? And, and, but yeah. Did, also, there's nothing about performance, right? So correct. This, in principle, like, we also could say that all the, I don't know, one of all the isotropic Gaussian separation, but then I give these long labels. So not even random, actually. Mm -hmm. So this says nothing about performance. Correct. This says nothing about uh, the, the structure of the Yeah, this is this the structure of the op, like the optimization. Right? And so there's no assumption about distributions here at all. Mm -hmm. The first <clears throat> condition in blue is the same thing as the description of the physics, or do you think it's fundamental for the results of the uh, it's fundamental for the results. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think uh, d order n is possible, but uh, when n is much bigger than d, this just plainly does not hold um, in, in some settings. Uh, there are some settings where it does. Right? I mean, the thing is, having rank that's at most 2, like, you kind of need to have a simple problem in order for that to be like a good thing to do. Uh, and yeah, so I can maybe, uh, th there, there are ways to relax it, but I don't think that we should expect this to hold like in, in general. And, and bigger than D. Yeah, uh, and bigger than D, yeah, generally it does not. There are settings where it can, but generally no. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I just want to uh, just, you know, emphasize that, you know, this result, if you think about what, what happens if you start from random initialization, right? we're not actually saying anything about initialization here. This result holds for any initialization. Uh, but if you think about starting from a random Gaussian initialization, then the rank at initialization is full rank right? with, with probability 1. Right? So what this is saying is that gradient flow has a very strong bias towards reducing the rank in the setting where the, the data is very high dimensional. Right, and, and I think it's, it is quite notable that there are many ways that you could imagine perfectly fitting the data, but what gradient flow uh, prefers is something that has a linear decision boundary for this problem, and it takes a particularly simple form. Okay, so I'm not gonna get, I'm running low on time, so I'm not gonna even bother with trying to communicate the proof. It's, you know, it's about the KQT con conditions for margin maximization, and so the proof is a lot of analysis of KQT conditions for, for, these non -convex, for this non-convex problem. Um, okay, so I want to maybe just speed it up so I can, so I can mention these results on benign overfitting. Um, okay, so, so I think... Okay, okay, that's, yeah, uh, it's fine. I want to spend some more time on this, okay. so yeah, yeah. Um, so, so benign overfitting. So as I mentioned before, the most kind of well understood uh, models in benign overfitting are this uh, kind of OLS, or linear predictors, and in particular, the ordinary least squares predictor. Uh, and, and in my opinion, the main reason for this is that there is a formula to use. Right? Uh, if you do not have a direct simple formula, then you know, it's, a, it's a little difficult to figure out where to start. Um, and, and I think this is a reason why you know, the linear regression setting 
is much more well understood than the linear, the, even the linear classification setting. Because the standard uh, kind of estimator that comes from uh, the typical optimization algorithms for classification are these max margin uh, linear predictors. And in general, there is no formula for the max margin linear predictor. Uh, there's a suite of works that kind of try to say like, well, in some settings, the linear max margin predictor is the same as the OLS estimator. And then you can use the OLS formula to say things. Right, but really, the set, there are settings where that is not the case, and we have much less to say about those. Is it because there's no formula? Um, but something that's nice about these, uh, you know, these implicit bias results I just said is that we actually can get a formula. Right, so that we can say that not that the decision boundary of these two-layer leaky ReLU networks, training by gradient flow, have a for, have a decision boundary that has this formula that is the same as a linear predictor where the linear predictor is just the a, a nearly uniform average of the training data. Right, and so what that allows for is being able to characterize uh, you know, benign overfitting in these two-layer neural networks by just looking at the ba generalization behavior of this uh, classifier, right, this nearly uniform average of the training data. OK. So uh, we'll talk about one distributional setting. Um, there's a kind of suite of a, a family of distributional settings that, that we are able to analyze. But all the kind of key ideas can be seen uh, in this one setting. So this is the one I'll talk about. Um, and so now we'll actually make an assumption about the training data, or that, that the training data comes IID sampled from a distribution, where this distribution is as follows. It's a, basically a kind of classical uh, class conditional Gaussian mixture model, but with artificial label noise added to it. OK, so we have some mean vector mu. And we have some like, clean labels that are sampled you know, uniformly plus minus 1. And then the x's are sampled such that one cluster is at mu, and then one cluster is at minus mu. Right? And the kind of cluster distribution has uh, independent sub-Gaussian components, or just think of isotropic Gaussian. Right, so that's a kind of clean distribution, and then we introduce noise by saying that within each cluster, we're going to flip the label to the opposite label with probability p. Uh, yes, yeah. So we'll, we'll get into that in, in the next slide. Um, but yeah, so this is the idea, right? We have this mean cluster uh, centered at mu and minus mu, and then we're introducing artificial noise by flipping the labels with probability p. Okay. Um, all right, so we're just going to formalize what I was talking about before about this, these uniform classifiers. So we'll, we'll call a vector or classifier u, which is a, just a vector in RD. We'll call it tau uniform with respect to the training data. If we can write u as the average, uh, a weighted average of yi xi pair, uh, the product of yi xi, where these weights are all strictly positive and the maximum ratio of the weights is at most tau. Okay. So here are the assumptions, and as a member in the audience just asked, uh, we, we do require some particular assumptions on, on this mean separation. Right, so we're going to have this uh, large constant C that's hiding everywhere, and we'll need at least this many samples. And then assumptions two and three are that the mean separation is growing like the dimension to some power, which is strictly less than 1 half, and that the dimension is large relative to n squared, and also something that uh, needs to be larger and larger as beta gets closer to 1 half. And I think what, what the audience member was thinking of is that, is, is that there's a problem here if you have this mean separation uh, very, very large. right? Then that means that you're going to have one component of your, your, your distribution is going to be very high variance. Right? And as I mentioned before, you can't expect neuroorthogonality to hold if you have very, very one component that is extremely high variance. Because right? it means that the dot product between things is going to be large when you need the norms to be much larger than that. Right? So that's the kind of reason why we need an upper bound on the mean separation. Right? So you can think about this as kind of saying that we're studying the kind of low signal to noise regime of Gaussian mixture models. Right? And so in particular, assumptions two and three together uh, imply these what I call high dimensional data, where the norms are much bigger than the pairwise correlations, and also that the uh, 
you know, that the, norm, the ratio of the norms is at most one. Um, and so what our result says is that if you have some tau, right, so a tau uniform classifier and tau is bigger than or equal to one, then if the noise rate is strictly smaller than one over one plus tau, then under these assumptions, with probability at least 99%, any tau uniform classifier satisfies the following. Right, so first, it achieves a perfect fit to the training data. So that's what is in red. It's saying that you get 100% training accuracy under the 0-1 loss. And next, that the test error uh, has a very nice bound. Right, so we have a lower bound of P. P is the label noise in the problem that we've artificially introduced. So we know that the test error is at least P. Uh, but interestingly, we also know that the test error is at most p plus something that is exponentially small as long as n times norm mu to the fourth over d is large. Okay, and so, so what these results say is that you have benign overfitting if this mean separation is growing like d to the one, but something d to the beta where beta is between one fourth and one half. And so why is this benign overfitting? Well, it's overfitting because we have label noise in the problem, you're achieving a perfect fit to the training data, and you have 100% training accuracy. And it's benign because the test error is very close to the noise rate. Um, just to parse this theorem a little bit more, um, I guess I, something else that's worth mentioning is that actually getting this, uh, these, these, this, this test error bound is, is optimal for the problem. The fact that we have exponential minus n times norm mu to the fourth over d is the best thing that you can hope for in the high dimensional setting. It's a really, it's, it's a very benign form of overfitting, uh, benign overfitting because you're achieving the optimal uh, excess risk that you can achieve for this problem even when you're overfitting. Uh, so something, you know, you know how, just to further understand what this result says is you can think about what is the kind of label noise rate that you can tolerate. Um, so if you consider tau equals one, this is just a, a literal average of the training data. This is one uniform. And so we can tolerate noise rates that are anything strictly smaller than one half. Right, so what that says is that even when 49% of the training data are uniformly random labels, you can achieve test error that is exponentially close to 49%. And if we recall what our previous results were saying, right, we, we had previously said that gradient flow converges in direction for two layer leaky value networks to something to, to a classifier that is tau uniform or tau is at most a constant. Right? And so what this means is that uh, gradient flow can tolerate uh, noise rates that are at, at most a constant, right? One over one plus tau and tau is order of one, so it can tolerate noise rates that are at most a constant. Um, we have exact, you know, we have exact bounds on what this constant is, but uh, you know, it's just a lot of equations I didn't want to show. And, and so something that to, to emphasize is that, you know, there's, when we talk about what's happening with gradient flow on neural networks, because we have this equivalence to this tau uniform linear classifier, the number of parameters in the network plays no role, right? So if you had a neural network with a billion parameters, uh, it will still, and you know, and you're, and you're in this high dimensional setting, right? So there's two ways to overfit, one from being high dimensional, one from having uh, the wider neural network that could fit things in different ways. Even in this setting, you're going to achieve the kind of minimax optimal test error for this problem when you're overfitting. Okay. Any questions about the result? Yeah? Sorry, maybe I'm not as familiar with the gradient flow. So, presumably a one parameter neural network wouldn't work well. So, what, there's some interdependence in the setup. Uh, no, a one a one neuron neural network uh, would work. It would work the same because it's a, a one neuron neural network is a linear predictor, and this this result holds for linear predictors. So, I mean, that's the thing is that we're working in in high dimensions, so that's how you can overfit. The kind of natural question is like, you know, that uh, how do you how are you even capable of overfitting when you just have a linear linear model, but the dimension is larger than the number of samples. Because the one parameter means a vector in RG, yes. not Correct. Real Cor number. Yes, yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a single real number that, that will not work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. So you need at least D parameters in some sense. Yes, yeah. And, and you need, or at least N, 
right? You, and yeah, and because d, d needs to be bigger than, you know, yeah. So the number of parameters is d, and you need d to be bigger than f. And even like d bigger than n squared is what most of these results require. Yeah. Great question, though. Any other questions? Okay, so I want to kind of try to give you some in intuition about, you know, how is such a thing even possible, right? So what, how, what, is this, what does this estimator look like that's able to both fit the training data well, achieve a perfect fit to the noise, and also be able to generalize well, right? Because these two things seem to be in contention with one another. Right, so let's look at what happens with the kind of standard uh, average, so the one uniform classifier U, which is just the exact average of the training data, and let's assume that the clusters have this uh, isotropic Gaussian data. Um, and you'll just recall how the data is generated. You first take Y tilde, which is gonna be the clean label, that's uh, so uniform plus minus one, and then you take X, that's centered at Y tilde mu, plus uh, an isotropic Gaussian. Right? And then we flip the labels to minus Y tilde with probability P. Okay? So what this means is that the training data can be partitioned into two sets. One, that's the clean uh, label, the cleanly labeled data, where yi is equal to the tilde yi, and then the noisy data where we flip the labels. All right, so let's just write out what this uh, classifier looks like. All right, so u is just the average. Uh, so on the clean labels, it's equal to mu plus yi zi, and on the noisy labels, it's equal to minus uh, mu plus y i z i. Okay, so that means that we have a total of uh, number of clean labels minus number of uh, noisy labels mu's there, and then we're summing over all the noise variables times y i, right? So sum of y i z i. Okay, so uh, you know we're looking at classifications, so scale doesn't matter. So all that matters is the direction. So let's just scale everything by one over uh, clean minus noisy. And what you get is that this vector has the same direction as mu plus a kind of average of the noise variables. And so let's call this kind of average of the noise variables delta n. Right, so this is something that depends on the training data, but it, you know, it's not something that we actually observe because it's the, you know, the kind of hidden noise variables zi. Um, but this is how we can write the, the, the direction of this classifier is as the cluster mean mu plus a noise variable. Okay, and so, you know, this, we'll call this thing in the green the signal component because this is really what we want to learn, right? In the sense of if you want to generalize well, you need to have mu appearing, right? Because if you have a clean test example, you want to be able to understand where it comes from, you need to, to know what mu is. Right, and so, the tension here is that this signal component helps with generalization, but it hurts with overfitting. Because right, if you think about just having the vector mu and you have a noisily labeled example, it's going to mislabel it right, because it's noisy and it's going to think that it came from the other cluster even though you know, it has the opposite label. Right, so that signal comp component helps with generalization, hurts with overfitting. Um, the overfitting component is the opposite, right? The overfitting component helps with overfitting because if you actually take this delta n and you uh, use that to classify y k x k, then it's going to be very large and positive. But since delta n is just pure noise, it will be useless for generalization. Right? There's nothing that it can say for for generalization. Right? So, I kind of, the kind of uh, core thing that one needs to do in this problem then is to kind of balance these two. And, and the remarkable thing is that you can balance these out where the signal that comes from the signal component is large enough to generalize well, uh, but it's not so large that you fail to overfit, and that the overfitting component is large enough to be able to, to overfit, but it's not so large to be able to prevent you from generalizing well. And so that's the kind of uh, high level idea about how you're actually able to do that um, you know, there's a bunch of math that you could do um, that I can get into if, uh, if, if, it's, if it's helpful, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's just equations, and the, the idea is there. Um, okay, I'm going to maybe start to conclude now, and just so I can leave a few minutes if there are any uh, questions. So what did we talk about? We talked about the implicit bias of gradient flow in two-layer leaky value networks when the data is nearly orthogonal, where I use this equation to 
kind of, to kind of define your orthogonality. Right? And it doesn't capture everything about high dimensional settings, but it captures some interesting things. And what we showed is that anything that satisfies the KKD conditions for margin maximization for this problem has a linear decision boundary, and that you know, we can actually get an equation for what this decision boundary looks like. Right? It's a nearly uniform average of the training data. And then we showed how we can use this, uh, you know, this kind of characterization to say something about the setting where we actually have samples from a distribution, right? as long as the dimension is sufficiently large relative to the number of examples. Right? And under, under the setting, we can actually show that these tau uniform classifiers exhibit benign overfitting, and thus so do uh, two-layer leaky value networks. Right? And just I briefly talked about how we could uh, use this kind of signal and overfitting component decomposition to, to be able to show that there is the possibility of, if you delicately balance things right, of being able to have benign overfitting. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to stop and take any questions. All right, thank you, Spencer. Really nice talk and really nice questions. Uh, that was a great start, so let's keep it up throughout the week and let's ask a couple of more right now. Um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, yeah, you cannot have a really high signal-to-noise ratio, right? So a signal-to-noise ratio is kind of correl correlates to the norm of the expected uh, you know, expectation of y-axis. Yeah. So there is, there is no way to treat the expectation separately. Because that's um, something dependent. Maybe you can get to it somehow. Yeah, so the... Our, our proof really crucially relies on this near orthogonality, and so any any setting where this near orthogonality does not hold makes it uh, we we don't really have a way of understanding it um, because basically to be able to understand the KQD condition for margin maximization, when you have this property, a lot of your life becomes easier, and when you don't have it, uh, things quickly become intractable, or at least like they're intractable to me. Um, it's possible that maybe there's ways of removing it. I'm not aware. No, no work. I mean, there are very few works that are able to say anything about benign overfitting in neural networks. So it's possible that things in the future will. But like, this is the most general setting where basically all settings. All, okay, there's maybe one paper. So there's like five or six papers on benign overfitting in neural networks that, uh, and five of the six, I guess, have a variant of this condition holding. Uh, I don't, but uh, I haven't, it's possible. I mean, I, I don't know. This is all quite new, so uh, the, there's a lot of things to, to try. Yeah. What is the six papers? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. There's like a two by me and some other people, I guess. There's some from my PhD advisor, Chen Chen Gu. His group has a few. Well, oh. what's, the, what's the assumption? You said five or six. Assumes oh, they have various. something like this. Yeah, what's, what's oh. the sixth one? What does uh, say the sixth one... I don't really understand. No, no, it's a higher signal to noise ratio regime. Um, I don't really know how they show overfitting in it, though. Yeah, I haven't carefully read it, but but yeah, that's the. There's one where they have been able to do it, but it's not. It it, it certainly is not. Uh, it doesn't generically hold for any KQT point of a margin maximization problem. It's a very like careful trajectory analysis of gradient descent in a two-layer neural network. Um, but yeah. So they can do something, but uh, it doesn't generically hold for any KKT point, which I think is uh, my saving grace in this. So. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, so, okay, so the. The main, the a core thing about that 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 I like about the homogeneity is that we that is the only setting where we know that uh, gradient flow on a neural network converges uh, to something that satisfies KKD conditions for margin maximization. So a question is, it, it's possible that the analysis could be extended for any KKT point of a margin maximization problem of a non-homogeneous neural network, but 
then it, the question is like, well, this is just setting margin maximizers of a neural network, but we don't know that gradient descent or optimization algorithms converge to such a thing. Um, but, but I think also there is a question of if the proofs can be extended to non-homogeneity. I, I, there are some points where we use it, but yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you again. <laughs>